I'm teaching on guilt this morning. Anybody, anybody heard you feel guilty sometimes doing things and then, you know, you, you, you try to live with the burden of guilt? And, um, you know, it's, it's like Nikki made the comment that I'm stubborn, you know, and or she was you know, like that. And I said, I'm, I'm not guilty anymore, <laughs> uh, was my thought. And, but no, it's good. Worship was really good. Uh, thank the worship team for all they do behind the scenes and the time invested in doing that. But uh, really just wanted to share on, uh, I, I don't know, I had it on my heart uh, this week of, I think guilt is probably the number one thing that causes people to walk away from God. Now, we know that according to the Word of God, God never walks away from us. It's not His desire, but we find ourselves sometimes feeling unworthy or how did I get to this place and why bother, why should I go through this? And, you know, it's a um, really, really... Um, sad, but the devil's really good at what he does, and any way that he can deceive us, he's going to try to do that to uh, really knock us off track. Amen. So the definition of guilt, as I looked it up, it said this: a feeling of having done wrong or failed in an obligation. Um, you, but just that feeling of having done wrong or knowing sometimes that we've done wrong, and and then you have to, you know, kind of face the consequences of that. Um, anybody here ever had to do that? Um, I, I'm, times in life, I, I'm, you know, have been there and got the T-shirt. I, I remember a few years back, our our two Jack Russells were getting older, and I think one was like 18 and one was 16. I don't know. You had you had one of the babies, and. Um, so one was just uh, had had to go. I mean, it was time to to put him down. The other one really couldn't see, and she was just um, even older than the other one. I think she was the one that was 17 at that point. So um, Kathy was going away to a woman's uh, conference, actually, that she was leading. Uh, was that probably like two, three years ago, something like that? So she was gone, and she knew I was taking Jake to uh, to go be with the Lord. And, um, and and Joey was there, and uh, and as she left, you know, I had this thought. I said, "There's no sense for me to do this and have to turn around two months later to bring the other one too." And they're married, <laughs> so I uh, looked at Joey. Joey, I mean, he's kind of like, "Let's do this." So we brought them both in, and um, said goodbyes, and you know, and all that. And Doc looked and said. She doesn't have more than two months at the most if, if she's going to do it. They, they were really bad. So anyways, when Kathy got home, you know that saying, if looks could kill? And I probably had that, you know, the cat swallowed the canary kind of look, dude. I just stayed out of the way for, for four days. <laughs> but I was thinking of that, you know, how many times we live with, with guilt from things that we do and I don't know that God wants us to live in guilt. I, I think he wants us to learn from mistakes, but not to live in guilt. They're two different things. And um, anybody here ever failed others in life? You ever failed yourself and you just know that? It's even, I think sometimes that's even harder, knowing that you failed yourself and that you wanted to do something and you worked so hard at doing it and then it didn't happen for whatever reason. But the truth is, guilt has so many sides, and it rears its ugly head in so many ways, and has so many tentacles that are attached to it. And um, and a lot of times we allow guilt to take us prisoner, and it will. It will take us as a a captive, and um, and it will do it whichever way that it can. You know, we say or do something at work, which causes us to lose our job. Whose fault is that, stupid? And then we listen to that voice. And, um, you know, and sometimes we're quick to say that to somebody else. Who's, whose fault is that, dummy? And um, we already know we don't need more guilt than mm-hmm. we already have. Uh, baseball players pay, paid millions and millions of dollars, and he gets up and he strikes out every time he gets up to the plate. 
and um, it doesn't need to hear all the booze and stuff like that, but it comes, and you know, you're already feeling bad enough, but then you got to get that heaped on top of you too. We say or do something in a relationship that causes its doom. And, you know, then you hear the statement, why would you say something that cruel? And it's kind of like, we say or do something in a friendship that severs it. And sometimes our response is, well, they had it coming and I'm glad that I got that off my chest. But then you start missing the friendship because the guilt sets in. And, you know, maybe there's better ways to go about something than to just getting something off your chest or sharing a piece of your mind, you know, a penny for your thoughts. It was only worth a penny anyways. Keep it. You ever have a bad day as a parent? Anybody here? Come on. And then we have to have thoughts like, how do you think destroying someone emotionally will somehow make them feel better? And yet we can go there. And then not only do we have the guilt of it, but they have the guilt of that because how do they live up to the expectations of something that's really not possible to live up to? For those of you students here, I know we have a lot of college-age students and and some younger students. Um, Have you ever had a bad semester at school? How's that feel? And on top of that, you knew that your parents wanted to see that report card when you get home. So the guilt just goes right to work. And you think of a million different reasons why you did so badly and how it's not really your fault. Been there and done that. The teacher didn't like me. My dad said, that's all you would ever tell me. All these teachers didn't like you. You didn't even have one teacher that liked you. I knew I wasn't alone. Or you own it, but you still feel like a failure anyways because you didn't live up to what you knew you could do. Or how about this? You sign up for a marriage that you thought would be forever. Come on. And forever just came yesterday. And then thoughts of guilt come in. Why is everyone staring at me? It wasn't my fault. But the truth is, guilt can take the biggest, the strongest, the smartest, the most godly people sometimes and make them slaves to their situation. But you don't have to live there. It's total deception. Guilt really is like an acid that that erodes us, is what it does. But grace is God's soothing touch that will come and calm the storm inside of us. And that's really what we need to hold on to. We need to grasp. We need to go after the very grace and mercy, the love of God. So listen, don't get all worked up and quit. It's easy to do that. Many, many have blazed that trail. We want to blaze a trail that says no matter what, no matter what I go through, the worst of days, bad times, good times, my flag is going to be permanently planted for the Lord. And as for me and my house, we say it, we'll serve the Lord. And nothing's going to come between us and the love of God, nothing. Satan is a liar, Mm -hmm. and you're not the first person that he ever deceived and tried to hold captive. You won't be the last one either. The truth is there's a whole list of great Bible characters Many that had to overcome guilt, depression, anxiety, low self-esteem. Um, anybody been there and faced some of those things too? How do you get through that? Because it really becomes powerful. So anyways, let's get encouraged a little bit as we look at some other great Bible heroes. And, and then uh, I think sometimes it's nice to know we're not alone. Amen? Because um, I think we fight this and we do that. And I'm so bad. I'm not, you know, I'm not worthy of the things of God. Um, but the truth is, you're not guilty anymore That's right. because of what Jesus did. Right. And we have to know that. There's going to be bad times. There's going to be bad days. There's going to be bad thoughts. Um, there's going to be bad words. But we just need to get them right. That's all. Mm-hmm. And um, God's not holding us to the carpet for every single thing we do wrong. But the devil would like you to keep you there. Mm-hmm. And that's what he does. In Genesis chapter 2. 
Verse 21. Uh, if you have your Bibles and you want to turn there, you can. If not, it'll be on the screen up front. It says, starting in verse 21, So the Lord God caused the man to fall in a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord took one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, This one is bone for my bone and flesh for my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. And ladies, make sure that he actually leaves his mom, or guilt will haunt you for the rest of your life. Because you will be compared to her, and how wonderful and great she did everything. Um, So, sever that thing. That was good. Is that... Is that good? Yeah? You like that? Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they, what does it say? But they felt no shame. They were naked. They were going around the garden, naked, no clothes. And they felt no shame. There was no shame. There was no reason why they had to feel shame or guilt or that's just how God created them. That was the way it was intended to be. Um, but but no guilt. Somebody say no guilt. No guilt. Then we have in Genesis chapter three, verse eight. You're doing great. Your walk with the Lord is excellent. God loves you. You're loving God. Satan hates the fact that you're there. He hates the fact that you're anything for God. Can't stand that you're in church. Can't stand you tell people about the Lord. Can't stand the fact that you're a Christian. Um, He loses his mind. But how can he take you out? That's his plan, always. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8, it says, When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord called to the man, Where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. And then he says this, I was afraid because I was naked. Well, who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat from? The man replied, It was that woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Nice try. But you think about ten verses before this. Ten verses. Just ten verses. We're not even talking about making it to the next chapter fully. Ten verses away. What just happened? The truth is the devil came in and stole their mindset. That's what he did. They knew they were all right. They knew there was no guilt. They knew they were walking with God. Now all of a sudden, sin comes in and they go a totally different direction. But that's what the devil does to all of us. It's what he does. He wants to get you as far away from God as possible. So by telling you that you're no good, you're worthless, you're just a sinner, you're no different than everybody else, we sometimes buy into that thought and it's like, well, what's the point? And he wins. Well, that's really what he did to Adam and Eve. They didn't even last ten verses. Ten verses. Have there been times in our life when we didn't last 10 verses? <laughs> Probably. And, um, you know, what do we do? We get, we, we're, we're almost embarrassed to see God. So we start retreating. But the truth is, if we don't get it right, like right away, listen, God wants it to be right. He, he still loves us. God's not changing. It's the mindset that gets now a challenge inside of us to start having us back up and pull away. God's coming toward us. We're backing up. God's walking in the garden to find us. We're trying to hide somewhere. 
And um, we've all done that. It's kind of like, I don't know if I want to see God right now. You know what I mean? I'm pretty sure he knows what I did or what I said or where I've been. And yeah, he does know because he knows everything. But he loves us anyways. Let me say this to you. Do you know that when we say yes to Satan's offers, which we do too much, all of us, but when we say yes to Satan's offers, we say no to God. They come hand in hand. Because in order to say yes to Satan, we have to say no to God. We know what the Word says. We know the right thing to do. Um, Even the Apostle Paul was good at that. Why do I do this anyways when I know I shouldn't do this, but I do this? Um, Sometimes we just get caught. But don't stay caught. That's right. Jesus freed us from captivity. We don't need to throw ourselves in a cage and lock the door. We need to stay free through the blood of Christ. Amen? Amen. So by doing this or buying into Satan's thoughts and ways, the guilt comes. And then the guilt comes like this. You know, if only I would have done this, maybe this would have changed. If I waited ten more minutes, this thing wouldn't have happened. How many times have you said or heard that? And the excuses start mounting. Then we reason why in our mind. All the while held prisoner until we allow God's grace and mercy to remove the venom that somehow got into us. And that's what we need to do with guilt. Guilt makes us go to some really dark places. Then there's times when we walk in guilt, we do something, and um, we pretend it never happened then. You know, it's kind of our defense mechanisms. Well, I, don't, I don't remember that. What, what are you talking about? Or we can belittle the situation. Wow, you know, it wasn't really any big deal. No, it was a big deal. Just repent. Get it right. Come on, move on. Or we blame shift. It's a whole lot easier. The woman made me do it. Yes, that woman you gave me, God. Um, Always easier to blame it on someone else. I used to like saying things like, well, I'm Italian. We can't help it. (laughs) Any other Italians ever do that? Come on, do not leave me hanging there. Thank you. Um, But doesn't that kind of say that all Italians are stupid? (laughs) But it does in a way. Because what we're saying, we're looking for an excuse as to why doing the wrong thing is somehow right or okay. And it's not. And we can't fall back on culture, whatever your culture is. If the culture is somehow wrong, then make it right. We don't need to continue this line of whatever maybe was wrong and and then blame it on that to say, hey, you know, it's just how I was raised i was brought up that way so i'm like that too change and the truth is it can also bring you to a dark depressive state and this i really believe happened to guys like elijah i believe it happened to guys like jonah peter um you know elijah got a, a letter from the devil's daughter her name was jezebel He got scared. This is right after he had a great victory on Mount Carmel. Remember that? Watched all these false prophets get murdered and, you know, um, just a great, great time of victory and God showing up in his fullness and power of God, miracles. And I know a lot of us like miracles. You got to remember right after victories and miracles, usually Satan comes right in to steal everything that just happened. And don't let him steal. God is a miracle-working God who loves us greatly, and that's his nature. And um, Satan steals. He's the counterfeit of everything that God does great. And here Elijah is right away. He gets a letter from Jezebel that says, I'll have your head this day. I, you know, what you did is nothing compared to what I will do to you. And he just gets scared and starts running. Well, here's a mighty man of God. should have never happened, but yet it did. How do you go from the high to the low? The cure for all of this was just God's grace. And it would have immediately reestablished his relationship with God. But for whatever reason, he wouldn't go there. 
He just wouldn't go there. He couldn't find himself there. It was like, I'd rather just die. And it's like God had to get him up, feed him. You know, the angel came and, and you know, then he raced on ahead. You know, I mean, it's just, and you wonder, how do we get to these places? And this stuff just, the burden of it all is so heavy that we actually start to believe it. Matthew 26 and verse 31 Story of Peter, we remember that. I mean, Peter, uh, of all the guys in the Bible, he's probably one of my favorite um, characters, only because to me, Peter was real. And um, it, there was nothing that kind of like he held back. And I know he said a lot of crazy things, and he would open his mouth and insert his foot, so to speak, a lot of times. And he was off the cuff, and um, but he seemed very real. Um, like a guy's type of guy, and, uh, and I appreciate that. In verse 31, it says, On the way Jesus told them, he's talking to his disciples here, Tonight all of you will desert me, for the scripture says, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will get scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead, I'm going to go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Well, Peter declared, Even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Pete, this very night, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times that you even ever knew me. Oh, no, Peter insisted. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. And, you know, we've established this before. Peter really loved Jesus. His heart was in a really good place as he was saying this. But he didn't understand that... um, Sometimes it's a lot harder than we think. Sometimes we get challenged more. But here it is, I mean, more than anything, that not only did he disappoint Jesus, but he disappointed himself and the actions that came. So uh, how many of us, though, have made promises to God where we only fell short in our promises too? And um, probably everyone in the room at least more than five times. And Peter was one of those guys. In Matthew 26, in verse 73 through 75, it says, A little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, You must be one of them. We can tell by your Galilean accent. Peter swore, A curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know the man. And immediately, the rooster crowed. Now, this was the third denial. And it says, Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before that rooster crows, you will deny three times that you ever knew me. And then he says this, he went away weeping bitterly. Do you suppose for a second this would have been a great opportunity for Peter to quit? Yeah, because that's what guilt does. And it's like, I could never be reestablished in the things of God because of this action. Therefore, I'm disqualified. And how could ever God ever trust or use somebody like me again? Listen, it's a lie from the pit of hell. There is not anybody in this room today that's perfect. You can't do it. So to put yourself in that category, to throw yourself in that cell and, and take the key and lock the, the, the cell and throw the key outside so you can't get out is crazy. But yet we do it all the time. Listen, Satan has deceived some of the most elect people in Bible history. Why do you think he's not good enough to dupe you as well, or me? He is. He's that good. So don't stay there. Rise above. Listen, you have so much value inside of you. You have so much gifting. There's so much love. There's so much kindness. There's so much wisdom from God inside your soul to be used for the purposes and glory of God. If Satan could shut you up somehow, that's his desire and that's his goal. And all we do is buy into it. Don't buy into it. Total deception. Amen? And also, don't make Jesus chase after you like he had to do with Peter, Elijah, and Jonah. It's easier just to surrender to God's grace. Quicker. Because he's merciful and he's loving. 
it's what he does. And we feel like somehow we're going to, I'm just going to escape. Isn't that true? It was that Jonah's mentality. It was like, you know, I think, um, although the Lord wants me to go to Nineveh, I think I'm going to go to Tarshish instead because I don't really want to go there. And he takes off in the opposite direction of what God told him to do. Opposite, total opposite. And God chased after him. What did he chase him with? A whale. A big whale. (laughs) And the whale caught Jonah. Uh, We know that Jonah got thrown over the boat. The whale feasted on Jonah. (laughs) Jonah was now inside the belly of this giant fish whale. Um, and um, he's just sitting there. So he's got seaweed wrapped around his head. You talk about guilt. And he's just not knowing what to do. All he has to do is repent. All he has to do is ask for the mercy and grace of God. Lord, forgive me, Lord. Let me, let's do this. But it's so hard. Pride and everything else that's welling up inside to him to say, you know, I can't do this. I can't. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to hold fast to my guns. It's like, dude, you're sitting in a fish's stomach with acid in there. You're turning white. You got seaweed wrapped around, all around your head, and you're going to hold on to pride for what? So finally he starts talking to God. Finally they start getting this right. And then the whale has to go all the way up to the beach and hawk him out onto the shore. <laughs> and it's like, Why? But we we got to we got to make God go to places like this for us sometimes, and He's not going to leave you. But we want to leave God somehow. God will will chase you. Don't let God chase you. Just surrender. How do you think David felt when he did um, Bathsheba and Uriah wrong? <coughs> David was no dummy. David was really really smart. He found out Bathsheba was pregnant. Wow, what a shock. How did that happen? Because you took someone else's wife and you slept with her. So then he had to try to kill the husband to get rid of him because he wouldn't sleep with her and come back and you know the whole story of David and Bathsheba. Then he gets the report of Uriah's death. He died on the battlefield. Why? Because he sent out a letter to make sure that he got killed. And then on top of that, he had to hear from God through the prophet Nathan. And it goes like this, 2 Samuel chapter 12. So the Lord sent Nathan a prophet to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owed nothing but one little lamb that he had bought. And he raised a little lamb and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day a guest arrived at the home of the rich man, but instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and he killed it and prepared it for his guest. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. What was David doing? He was cursing himself. He didn't know it at the time. Then he says this, He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You're the man. The Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wife's and the kingdoms of both Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stole his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. And this is what the Lord says, because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes. He will go to bed with them in a public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. Then David confessed. Then David confessed to Nathan. I have sinned against the Lord, Nathan replied. 
Yes, but the Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for this sin. You know, thank God we live in the New Testament. And we're under the new uh, covenant from Jesus. Because the truth is, Jesus took on all our sin. All of our guilt. All of our trespasses. And he bore them on the cross at Calvary. And because he did that, the retribution, like it was in the Old Testament, is not like it is in the New Testament. And um, praise God. Because if we had to be held accountable for everything that we did, Johnny on the spot, how many of you know it, it, would, uh, it would be really, really painful? I was thinking as you, as you talk about guilt... Do you ever think that anybody ever reminded Paul about all the Christians that he murdered as he was doing his ministry? I'm sure he probably had to live with that just about every day. They knew who he was. They knew what he did. They wouldn't even know they really want him on their team in the beginning. Um, but God had a plan for Paul. And that was to change and to get it right. Which shows the mercy and grace of God is alive and well on this earth. How could somebody like that ever have a seat at the table with God? But we can, and you can, and I can. And even at times when um, we don't do everything right, God is right with us. And His righteousness is deep with inside of us. What we need to do is let go of the past. God wants to move forward with you, not go backwards. He wants to pour His grace out on you. He wants you to claim your forgiveness through His Son, Jesus Christ. And I guess the thought is, can we? And will we? I know that there's times when uh, it gets really, really hard. I know that there's times when guilt is, uh, is really uh, a heavy burden. Anybody here have a dog? Anybody here have, or have had dogs? And you know, dogs are a special type of animal, um, different from cats in many ways, and they both have their own cuteness and different things. Um, but if you've ever uh, had a dog, chances are at some point in life, you've come home from wherever you were and your house wasn't quite the same. <laughs> Anybody, you, you know what I'm saying, right? And you look in and you say, how... Could you take that particular item and shred it into so many different pieces in just the hour or two hours that I was gone? How could you do that? And then when you finally find them, because it's the one time they don't greet you, right? <laughs> and you find them and they're hiding somewhere and they have that look in their eyes. It's kind of like... And they just know, and they know that they know, and it's like they're in that state until you somehow let them know it's okay, which usually comes after whacking them once or twice and cleaning up the entire mess, and then you gotta, you got to love them anyways, because they're yours. They had a bad day. And you know, the truth is, you know, the couch could be replaced. Sometimes it's the couch, not just pillows. Or shoes, um, or the furniture. Um, they're good at the, all that stuff. But you know, it's like kids, but it's like us as kids unto the Lord. And the forgiveness of God is long, it's, it, it's far reaching. And He loves us so much. I have a video with the song to it. Um, some of you I know have heard the song. It's a, it's a really neat video. If you want to get that started, Corey? And then Andrew, after the video, is going to come up and close us in a prayer. Um, listen, we'll have people up front afterwards to pray for you. Listen, we love you guys. Don't let the devil rob from you. we got too many great things to do for the Lord. Amen? Amen. <laughs>